Y'all are going to have to bear with me. My voice is going a little bit. Uh, you can thank UCF Knights for that one. Um, it was a great game, at least after the first quarter. So if you were wondering why we sucked at the beginning and then got really good, that's what I left. Not even joking. Like, seriously, that's what I walked out of the stadium. Wonderful. All right. So do uh, a couple of quick things here. Uh, remember that I can send you the lecture um, recordings only if it's considered a student absence. There's kind of some funkiness with like, what is defined as an online course versus what is an online course. And administration should be very vague about shit. So there's a good chance that I I'm fighting right now to see if I can just have to put up the link to the YouTube channel that can post all this stuff. And hopefully that can be available to everybody. But keep in mind too that you know I know it's not ideal given the circumstances of what's going on. Um, but if you can be, come kind of lecture. Um, it usually works out a lot better in your favor. You're going to hear stuff that I'm not necessarily going to talk about. There's going to be, you know me, I talk with my hands. I try to point out examples and specific things on the slides, but that stuff's not going to necessarily translate over because it's just copying over what's on my screen. So there are advantages to coming in here. And let's be real here. We all know that when y'all watch this stuff online at home, you don't pay attention. Right? Um, nothing wrong with that. I do the same shit, but still. Like, it's just harder to pay attention when you're watching it the same kind of YouTube channel for 40 minutes, even at double speed. So, but that is something I am trying to look into and trying to see if I can just post that without having to send every person that sends me an email saying that they're sick. A, you know, email with the link to it. So bear with me on that. I'm trying to get it fixed. So just general class reminders. Remember that quiz due is due on Sunday at 11.59 p.m. Remember, you should probably start it before 11 because I'm not going to be checking my email. And if you're having technical issues at 11 o'clock, that usually means that you probably just didn't do things. Um, so just keep me in the, if there are issues with the, the quiz or whatever, just let me know. I, haven't, I know I've seen people already take it, so in theory, it hasn't been a problem yet so far, but just keep me in the loop. Um, so remember that next week's quiz will, again, be due on a Sunday like normal, but you may want to consider taking it a little bit early, considering you do have your first exam on next Friday. So speaking of that, again, oh, come on. Um, remember that exam one is next Friday, September 10th. At 12.30, we will start exactly at 12.30. Me and my UTA will be helping to pass everything out. And as you're leaving, I'll probably just set up back there somewhere so you can just hand me your Scantron and your uh, tests. And so I can, yeah. They're provided. Yeah. So don't worry about that. I'm going to try, like I said, I try to keep the things. But yeah, uh, it'll be over the first seven lectures. Uh, Remember that next Monday, you don't have class. Take advantage of it. Uh, I would say study, but we all know you're not going to. <laughs> um, and then we'll have one more lecture on Wednesday before your exam on Friday. Uh, the lecture on Wednesday is a little dense. So that one, make sure you're comfortable with everything else prior to it. So that way you only have to focus on really getting, making sure everything's good and solid on that last lecture. Um, but once we move on past this unit, we're going to be getting into anatomy and physiology. How uh, war y'all? That's our first unit. unit. So you want to do well on this one, and you want to do well on the, the two that are after it, because that second one is usually what people do well on the best. So, um, as always, I know it's not always practical in here, but please wear a mask if you can. Um, I know a lot of y'all are vaccinated. If you haven't, at least look into it. There's nothing harm in it. You know, I went through that process. It, Sucked for about a day after because I had had it previous or had COVID previously, but other than that, it wasn't that bad. So, if you're medically eligible for it, look into it. Um, but yeah, any other questions before we get done with kind of the reminder section? Yeah. So, sort of. Um, basically, what I did is there's five questions like there normally are, so I'm not, I'm not sure. Because uh, each lecture is usually, but I went back here and pulled some other quiz that were linked directly to the previous two. That way you can practice a little bit. Before 
the final exam. Or, you know, the first of the test for this. So remember these tests are cumulative either. So while you might see some very similar things, because biology obviously builds on itself, I'm not gonna, we're probably not gonna spend a whole lot more time on chemistry after this week. Um, all right, any other questions? All right, perfect. Um, so again, today we have another one of those little mini lectures. Um, and lecture today is probably going to be a little bit on the short side, so bear with me. I'm sure y'all aren't complaining about that. All right. So, I'm you're in here. You're hearing me talk about science, right? But not everybody gets that opportunity. You don't always have like a university that you get to go to and hear about cool stuff that's happening, even though you didn't know it was happening, right? So science communication has become a huge part of effectively communicating to the public. Honestly, it's been kind of frustrating to watch, but the reason why COVID-19 and the way we're handling right now has been so polarized and divided is because people keep on they kind of treat people like they're stupid when they try to communicate them to them, right? Think back to right in March of 2020, when uh, Dr. Fauci was out talking about how you don't need masks, they're completely useless, all this kind of fun stuff. And he was basically lying so he could buy time for people to be able to build up that supply. That was really fucking stupid. And all that did is create a lot of animosity and a lot of distrust for how the CDC was handling things. And they did that shit over and over and over again. So it's really important to not only communicate effectively, but communicate honestly. Like as a scientist, or at least how I perceive scientists should be, um, you should be thinking about how you should communicate because otherwise you're just not gonna get that information out there. Now, most science is traditionally communicated through scientific journals. The pros for this is they are very specialized and so you can publish some very specialized work in it. And it's going to be peer reviewed, just as a process of being you know, published in those journals, which means it's probably a lot more reliable than looking at something like Wikipedia. I'm not saying Wikipedia is bad, it's just, you know, it takes a little bit longer for it to be peer reviewed as such as like a scientific paper. And don't get me wrong, peer review is not exactly perfect. It has issues, but it's a lot better than just publishing something without, you know, just a grammar edit. However, very few people have access to this. You know, people that work at USGS or other governmental agencies, just lay people that might be interested in something about the biology of a snake or something because they're interested in trying to breed it for their you know, own shits and giggles. I don't know. Um, they can't have access to that unless they pay like 50 to $80 a fucking paper, which is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, if you're ever bored and you need to access some sort of science paper for both this class or outside of the class, um, there may or may not be some good websites out there that are designed specifically to harvest that information without having to pay for it, just saying. Mm. But because of this, it's often really difficult to access published scientific studies, so it becomes really important for scientists to not only publish their scientific you know, articles, but to translate that into popular media, right? Now, historically, this is done through books and magazines, things like you know, popular mechanics and some of that stuff that you guys might remember from like getting when you were in, you know, elementary school at like book fairs. Granted, I might be a little bit too old. Y'all might be a little too young for that. Um, but still, like in the last decade or two, they still were doing those kinds of things. But obviously the landscape's kind of changed recently, right? Uh, the internet's amazing. The amount of knowledge that you can gain is absolutely incredible. Unfortunately, you get a lot of other crap too, but you know, you do what you can with it. But scientists have gone out of their way a lot of times, or at least some of them have, to learn how to adapt to this new environment and be able to communicate their science in cool ways. So that way it's not just lost in the ether of a scientific paper, but it's you know translated to, especially for people working in conservation or ecology, you need to be able to talk to just regular folks, you know? Um, we always make the joke of, if you can't speak to somebody who goes to a NASCAR race, you have no business doing science because you need to be able to communicate to people. So here's a couple of cool examples I was like pointing out. Obviously blogs were a huge thing back in the like mid to late 2000s. Um, so here's one that's actually written by a guy named David Steen. 
He does a ton of amazing work and now runs a conservation and outreach uh, group that all they do is fund graduate students and undergrad students to do work in uh, underrepresented countries. So that way they can you know, get more information out there, especially with natural history of different animals. Really cool stuff. But then you get things like YouTube, you know? Let's see if it'll actually work today. It should have subtitles, maybe. There we go. And we're not gonna watch all this. I just wanna show a little bit of example. This is from Mid-Earth, great YouTube channel. Oh, maybe. If, but anyways, like it's, it's, you know, taking a scientific paper and digesting it down to two to three minutes to explain a really cool concept and why everything kind of interrelates with each other. I don't think we're gonna get very far with this, unfortunately. Uh, sorry about that. Um, I can provide the link in the lecture if anybody's interested in watching it, but it's, it's just a cute video about how everything is essentially a fish if you're a vertebrate. Pause that and pick up on that. What the fuck? Sorry, that was really loud. Uh, give me just a second. Like I said, we'll watch like a couple seconds of it just so you can see, you know, different styles, different. Um, You get the idea. It's just taking re really larger, bigger picture concepts and boiling it down. And sometimes you know, it could be single paper, or it could be you know an entire. You know, why does cladistics and and things like that work the way they do? Of course, Twitter. Here's somebody literally posting about a study that they just did with a quick, brief understanding of like, hey, this is what we're doing and why it's cool. Check out these you know, hashtags that directly relate to it. Here's a picture from that scientific paper that help explain what's cool about this paper. Honestly, if you're really bored, go check out science Twitter. It's usually pretty interesting, at least when they're not fighting with each other. And hell, even things like TikTok. Like, there's a lot of things now that people are using to, hopefully this will actually work, we'll see. Maybe. Hang on. There we go. But, you know, like taking, you know, something that's really important for this person's PhD, dialing it down to just, you know, having some fun with it. Sorry, the audio is shit in this thing. Uh, but well, you see my point, though. There's a lot of different avenues for this. There's a lot of ways you can do it and it can be funny. It can be, you know, just a quick summary of what you did. It could be much broader concepts that are done with like flash art animation. There's a lot of different ways you can go with it. And it's really cool. So now that I've kind of showed you some examples and kind of given you a taste for why communication or like communication in science is important. And keep in mind, this isn't just for scientists. I know a lot of y'all are in psychology. So you have to do some very similar kinds of things. But it's important for somebody outside of science to be able to find this information, read a scientific paper, and understand what's going on. Because oftentimes, there's some really shitty headlines that go out with some of these papers, or things like, coffee will now give you cancer. But if you looked up in Google and type in, does coffee give you cancer, you can probably find three or four different answers, and for very different reasons. So sometimes it's you know, beneficial is just general lay public to understand how to 
you know, read a basic scientific paper and communicate that idea. So that way, if you see Jim Bob on Facebook complaining about something, you can tell him why he's wrong without being an asshole. So this leads us to our first connecting with biology assignment. Um, I'm simply just asking you to learn how to take the contents of a scientific paper and translate that into some sort of short communication that highlights the study and why it matters. That why it matters part is probably the most important part of that sentence. So what y'all are gonna do is you're gonna read one of, I think I posted five scientific articles. If you want to do a different one than what is up, up, up there, go look for one and send it to me and I will be happy to take a look and see if it's appropriate or not. And that, and you know, if you're a psychology person and wanna do something on animal behavior, that's fine. If you're a marketing person and want to talk about how, you know, people calculate the prices of timber and how that changes how you harvest things, like that kind of stuff is important too. Um, all a lot of cool stuff. But the big thing is, is then you're going to digest that information down into a 500 character Twitter post or a 30 to 45 second TikTok style or YouTube short style. So those are a little bit different. Um, summarizing the article that you read. The assignment's got to be turned in on Canvas in a Word document. So if you do like the, the video style, just clip the link right into that Word document and send it to me. Um, I won't be sharing any of these. I don't feel like you, you're, don't be too nervous about posting it. Like I'm not going to, that's why like, for instance, with the YouTube stuff, feel free to like, just put a short video on it. That would even be TikTok style, quote unquote, but just keep it unlisted. So that way you don't have to you know, put it out to the world if you don't want to. Um, but yeah, so if you have any questions about this element of it, let me know. I'm happy to kind of talk about that stuff. Now, the important thing with this is pretty straightforward rubric here. Total out of 10 points, it's worth about 5% of your grade. Um, a single point for if you can communicate that's just the general topic and what that the paper focuses on. Two points for communicating the, the goal of the study. Two, or a point for communicating how the study was conducted. Uh, a point for explaining the results of the study, and then three points for explaining how the results matter to the bigger picture of things. And of course, just two points at the end, incorporating some sort of image or hashtag if it's relevant, that kind of stuff. Have some fun with this. Like, I'm not looking to like hammer people on this stuff, but try to have a little bit of fun with it. All right. September 27th. You have about a month to do it. And all this stuff is on Canvas as well. There's a full document with all this information. So if you have questions, obviously ask me. But um, if you want to just double check things, that's probably the place to go. Yeah. Any other questions? I promise this assignment doesn't seem that bad. If there's something weird going on, I can catch it before it you know becomes an issue. All right, any other questions? Yeah. Sure. That's fine. Uh, whatever way works. Um, yeah, I, I don't feel like you have to post it was my thing. Like, I just want to make it to where it's that style, because obviously there's a big difference between a YouTube short, which might be a little bit more kind of traditional ed or editing and that kind of stuff, whereas TikTok has a lot of, you know, resources at its disposal with, you know, sound or music and sound files and what have you. And, and you can have some fun with it. So, but yeah, if however way you can get it to me, I'll try to find it. I, I may need to double check and make sure that I can accept larger files. But if all else fails, post, or, you know, download that video, throw it on YouTube as an unlisted video, and that'll work too. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, if you want to. I'm happy either way. If you want to post it, go for it. Like, I just don't want you to feel like you have to. Because I know some people get a little bit squirrely about that. The reason why I'm kind of big about this too, in a class, my wife took me to school. I, I thought it was easy yay, or easy yay. She disagreed with me, um, but it was about forestry and wildlife at the state of Georgia. 
And uh, one of her assignments is she had to take the song Hotline Bling and turn it into an ecology song and then have to sing it as like an ecology karaoke. And my wife just is mortified singing and hated it to death. And so I want you to still kind of get that experience in a more relevant way without having to put yourself out there. So that's, that's the only reason why it's like, if you want to put it out there, that's great. That's fine. I'm okay with that. But if not, that's fine too. Yeah. Sure. Or, you know, honestly, if it comes down to it, you know, just put it into a Word document and throw the pictures that you would have put up in it with the hashtags that you would have put in it, that kind of thing. Either way is fine. Any other questions? And like I said, don't take this assignment too seriously. These are meant to kind of buffer your test grades a little bit. So have a little bit of fun with it. I'm not going to grade it super harshly. Just, I'm not, it, you know, it, if you address what's in that rubric, you'll be fine. You know? All right. So let's go ahead and get started with the rest of our lecture today. Today we're going to be talking about the energy of life. So obviously we've talked multiple times now at this point when we talked about chemistry and cells and all that kind of fun stuff that life requires energy for carrying out chemical reactions. Whether that be transporting molecules in and around the cell, maintaining normal constancy, you know, uh, homeostasis, energy is needed to keep the organelles within a cell or within an organism organized. Otherwise you can't have life function the way it is. Now energy comes in two different forms. You have kinetic energy, which is energy of movement. Think of as you're riding a roller coaster, it's that movement that you're getting as you're dropping down. Whereas potential energy is stored energy that's available to do work. So going back to our roller coaster analogy, or in this case, a bike, um, that's when you're sitting up at the top of the lift hill getting ready to crest over it, right? That, how many of y'all have ever ridden Shikra at Bush Gardens? When you're sitting there in that stupid hold break, just staring down to the ground for two seconds, that's when all that potential energy is. But when it finally releases and you drop and hit 70 miles an hour, that's your uh, kinetic energy. And energy can be converted from one form to another, just kind of like what we talked about. They went from this potential energy of just sitting at the top of the chain lift to kinetic energy of dropping down that first drop. Now, energy has to change a lot within biological systems. And remember too, that energy can't be created or destroyed. And that's based off of the first law of thermodynamics. Again, we're not gonna get too crazy into that because unfortunately biology touches everything in physics and chemistry, but we just don't have time to get into all of it, I promise. Now, something that we've kind of mentioned and uh, touched on, but not without really saying what it was, is something called entropy. Now, entropy is a measure of disorder. Elements and molecules and all this stuff are always going to be perpetually moving towards more and more and more chaos and disorder. However, you can use energy to kind of fit them back into the box. And that's why it's so important for you know, all these chemical reactions for life to occur, to have that energy to be able to you know, maintain homeostasis. Now, since heat energy is constantly being lost to the universe, heat energy is considered disordered, and that's the entropy of the universe is increasing. This is called the second law of thermodynamics. Ultimately, as you, you know, continue to just exist, entropy is going to expand and expand and expand. Now, met metabolism is going to include all these chemical reactions in a cell. Um, so when we're building complex molecules out of simple parts, like taking monomers and turn turning them into polymers, remember, uh, monosaccharides versus polysaccharides, amino acids versus proteins, all that kind of fun stuff. During that process where you're forming these chemical bonds, it uses energy. And then to break those complex molecules apart, you're still gonna use energy. See if y'all remember this. What is the term for when you put together two monomers? Yeah. Perfect. What about the opposite? There you go. So y'all know this shit. Y'all acting so quiet. Look, I know everybody's exhausted and we're up till two o'clock in the morning, but I've been here since 6 a.m. after driving home and getting home at two o'clock last night. So 
If I can be up here and have energy, I think y'all can too. All right. Now, chemical reactions can require or release energy. So reactions that form bonds to build molecules often require energy input. That inputted energy is then stored in those chemical bonds. So that way, when you break those chemical bonds, it then releases that energy. Remember, because you can't ever destroy energy. You're using it. It's being stored up in one way, shape, or form, and it's being broken apart, and it's releasing that energy. And this occurs in different ways, too. Um, probably the classic example of this is like when you're doing just some basic you know, cooking or something like that, that excess heat that's being given off when you're running a chemical reaction. Uh, great example of this. Um, how many of y'all ever built like one of those weird volcano things for like a science fair project in, in like somewhere? Okay. So some of y'all may know what I'm talking about. So when you're combining the baking soda and vinegar together, you notice how it's a little bit more warm when that foam comes out? That's because as you're creating that reaction that creates that like volcano explosion or whatever, um, that heat that's being given off is the release of that energy from it. Another great example is you're sitting here typing on your computer and you notice how much hotter your computer is getting, especially if your fan doesn't work like mine. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that you've got all these new reactions and things just around on those uh, computer chips. And just by all those electrons moving around, it's generating heat. It's all that energy is being given off. That's why you can't just, you know, perpetually have a battery that works for forever because all that, you know, energy that was being used to power your device, some of that's being given off as heat energy. Some of that's being given off as light energy. That's kind of what we're going here with this. Now, some chemical reactions require transfer electrons. And so we kind of mentioned this a little bit with hydrolysis and um, dehydration synthesis, but these are oxidation or reduction reactions where you have a molecule that's going to take on an electron or a molecule that's going to uh, remove an electron. So an, elect an electron donor molecule is going to be a molecule that's giving away one of its electrons to form a reaction. And that's when it goes from a molecule gives up its electron that's considered ox oxidization. However, when an electron acceptor molecule is receiving electrons, it's being reduced. I know that kind of sounds counterintuitive, like you're taking on things and you're reducing it somehow. but yeah, it's kind of a pain. Yeah. Yeah, that's why, but you know, because you're you are reducing the you know the value of the electron, but or the the charge of the thing, but that's why it is that way. But it just sounds like if you just were to hear the words reduction, it doesn't sound like you're gaining something, right? So I just like to point that out just because, you know, especially if you're not super familiar with chemistry or physics, it tends to be something that people get tripped up on. Now, oxidation and reduction uh, reactions can occur simultaneously. This is known as a redox reaction. And one of the great examples of this is the electron transport chain. So this is a series of membrane proteins participating in sequential linked oxidation reduction reactions. Basically, what it's allowing it to do is move these electrons from one spot to another. And by doing that, it's able to generate more and more energy. So, for instance, this is coming out of the um, cellular respiration, which we'll go into a lot more detail on this later. But by doing this, it takes the, like five or six molecules of ATP to get out of this, you know, breaking apart uh, oxygen and uh, sugar to. 32 ultimately by the time you're said and done for that single molecule. It's basically able to take the electrons that were given off in that reaction, move it down this chain, generate more and more and more ATP until it's finally used up. Uh, redox reactions release a small amount of energy at each step. For instance, in photosynthesis and cellular respiration, both use these electron transport chains that we've been talking about. So as energy is released, cells store it and then use it in other reactions. And that's what allows it to you know, generate all these extra ATPs, for at least for respiration. Speaking of ATP, ATP is the, the 
uh, how's the best way to put it? This is kind of like the, anyways, this is just the easiest way to describe the smallest, more, most readily accessible molecule that's used to generate energy in cellular reactions. Um, ATP is better known, is also known as adenosine triphosphate. It's a nucleotide that temporarily stores energy um, and it's the form that most cells will use to store that energy because it's fairly you know, efficient. Basically, all cells are going to rely on the potential energy stored in ATP to power chemical reactions. And so basically what happens is you're able to store all that potential energy in that little triphosphate group that's hanging off the side of it. Now, the reason why we have all this stuff stored in a you know, potential chemical react or a potential energy chemical reaction is so that way when we need that energy for other things, we can use it, right? So as we're you know, breaking apart this ATP, it releases that stored energy. So removing that endpoint phosphate group by hydrolysis is going to release that potential energy stored in ATP, and that cell can then use that energy to do work in other fashions. And this turns into what we call EDP. Uh, ATP is primarily formed during something called cellular respiration, as we've been talking about. Now, cellular respiration is a series of chemical reactions that take the energy from sugar and oxygen, interact those two things together, and produce ATP from ADP. So make sure you, you definitely, as you're going through things, clarify ATP versus ADP. One is the one that's got all the stored potential energy, and the other one is where you're going to bind that kinetic energy to, so you can then use it for later on. Now, ATP is coupled with a wide variety of different chemical reactions. These reactions that break the ATP down are coupled with uh, reactions that require energy input. <laughs> so when re these reactions are coupled together, energy is released from ATP and that can power that second reaction. It's kind of like, um, especially long boards, I think use this a lot where you have like the electrical motor that's on it as well to kind of help push it along a little bit faster, give you that little bit of extra boost. Yeah, it takes a little bit of human power to store it, but then you have the electricity. The same thing with like, I think there's electrical bikes that you can get now that are like, have the electrical assists for things like mountain biking and things like that. Very, very similar. Then further speed these things along using enzymes. So enzymes in particular are gonna help to speed up biochemical reactions. So any chemical reaction that occurs in a cell must occur very quickly to sustain life, right? You can't just sit around and wait for that reaction to occur. You need it to occur fairly quickly so you don't just completely lose everything. And an enzyme is a protein that acts as a catalyst. So by, it basically has these extra special spots on that protein that bind in particular ways to certain molecules that are going to help increase the rate at which these molecules can interact and uh, interact with each other and go through a biochemical reaction. Now it's gonna ultimately speed up the chemical reaction itself without being consumed. Now, enzymes are responsible for converting reactants into product. So taking, you know, paper and ink and turning that into a book. So here's just a couple of uh, terminology that'll be useful for the quizzes and such. Uh, you have substrate, which is what the enzyme acts on. It's like, um, if any of y'all have ever kept pets, like fish or what the water that's in the fish tank or the, you know, aspen chips in a snake cage, that's the substrate, right? The reactants are the molecules present at the start of the reaction. So that's going to be what you've got. So for instance, talking about cellular respiration, that's the sugar and the oxygen. And then your products, those are going to be anything that's present at the end of the reaction, whether they be useful or not. Now, enzymes help to lower what we call the activation energy. This activation energy is defined as any energy required to start a reaction. So without the enzyme, the activation energy is high. But when you bind this enzyme to the substrate, that active energy, activation energy is lowered. So basically, you have a lower threshold to get past those things. Now, temperature can affect how well an enzyme is going to work. So most enzymes are active within very specific temperatures. 
with the optimal temperature being at which their activi activity is gonna be the best. So a great example of this is there's something called PCR where we can basically artificially replicate DNA over and over and over again. Well, in order for it to work, you have to heat your solution up to a very specific temperature to denature that DNA and break it apart. And then you have to heat it up even higher to then allow for a particular enzyme that we've you know, found that works to you know, replicate DNA without having to put it into a bacterium uh, to be able to just replicate it over and over and over again. And then you can cool it off and it stops that replication process. So that way you can anneal the DNA back together again. And so by doing that process, say 40 times over, you start with one piece of DNA, becomes two pieces of DNA, becomes four pieces of DNA, becomes eight pieces of DNA, becomes 16, becomes 32, whatever. It's, it kind of increases the algorithm. But there's also chemical factors that can affect enzyme activity. So enzymes also have optimal salt concentrations or particular pHs that they like to work at, um, at which they function the best. So all that stuff kind of factors in so that way if you know you want to get an enzyme to work at very specific circumstances, you're going to have to kind of put it in that context. Now, substances can either enter or exit cells through membranes, um, like we've talked about. So the cell's interior is chemically different from its exterior. And so it's using that phospholipid bilayer like we talked about to kind of separate things, right? And these membranes form barriers in the cell. So only certain things can pass through a cell membrane, right? That's why they have that phospholipid bilayer. It helps to keep what you want on the outside outside and what you want on the inside inside. But that also means that there's some things that come up because of that. You have to deal with concentration gradients. Sometimes you may need more salt in the cell than that's available on the outside of the cell. And you can't just be perfectly equidistant between the two. Or you might need the chemical nature of a substance. So it's polarity, it's charge, or it's size that results in you having to move it in or out of the cell at different times. So this gradient that we've been mentioning is the concentration difference. So basically, this gradient starts with a fairly light color. A few molecules near the tea bag than in the rest of the teacup. But over time, it slowly spreads out and kind of spreads itself through the rest of the teacup. Where by the end, there's no gradient at all. It's all the same color of you know, liquid. There's no real difference. However, it's important to maintain that concentration gradient in a lot of cases. So that requires entropy, or sorry, requires energy. So a gradient is more ordered, you know, has less entropy. When there's no, or then when there's no gradient at all. Man, I'm losing my voice here. Entropy tends to increase unless there's some sort of force preventing it. So what in this case could you do to prevent the diffusion of T into this figure? Exactly, you could pump out the water or you could um, put some sort of barrier around that, where that water is that's currently being influenced, right? Now, simple diffusion going in and out of a cell doesn't require energy. So simple diffusion is a type of passive transport. It takes place where there's a concentration difference on one side, but uh, or where you've got a really high concentration and a low concentration on the other. Those molecules are going to move from that high concentration to the low concentration. Now, small nonpolar molecules can take advantage of this to cross the cell membrane by simple diffusion. But the size and the chemical properties of these small nonpolar molecules are what allow them to do this. Not all molecules can take advantage of this kind of thing, particularly large polar molecules. Uh, so for instance, one of the types of simple diffusion that we have is osmosis, which doesn't require any energy. Osmosis is a type of passive transport where it takes water from inside of the cell and moves it outside of the cell or reverse. Um, and it takes place in a different concentration uh, where again, as long as you have you know, more solutes in one side and less solutes in the other, that water is going to move to where those solutes are to keep it out. And there are ways to regulate this as well, where there's active transport ways to remove water if you need to. Now, osmosis determines the water content in plant cells oftentimes. Plant cells usually keep their solute concentrations fairly low inside rather than outside of their cells, so that way water will enter the cells. And these hypotonic surroundings result in a loss of water shrinking that larger central vacuole. 
And this can ultimately cause that tur that loss of turgor pressure that we were talking about. Now that there's not enough water inside of the cell, it's kind of wilting and almost looks like it's dying. Now, osmosis can also determine the water content in animal cells too. Water is constantly moving in and out of our blood cells by osmosis. So here you have blood cell in an isotonic with a perfect condition where it's supposed to be water. There's a hypotonic that means it's got too much water inside of the cell because it's got a fairly low gradient of all the solutes inside of it. And then when you have you know, too much solutes inside of the cell, it pushes all the water out. Um, that's where you're going to get that hypertonic solution. In an isotonic solution, it's going to be an equal solute concentration between the inside and the outside of the cell. In the hypotonic, sorry, I mixed them up when I first said it, um, higher solute concentration inside of the cell than on the outside of the cell. And for a hypertonic, you have a lower solute concentration inside the cell. So in order to deal with um, you know, all these concentration gradients that are just kind of happening on their own, it's best to, especially if you want to maintain, you know, a lower entropy and keep things in certain places that you need, to have some other ways of moving things in and out of a cell. So first we'll talk about facilitated diffusion. Now this doesn't require energy. Uh, this is another form of passive transport which occurs when the membrane proteins that are present on the outside of the membrane itself, which do require energy to produce, but they're not requiring energy to activate, are going to help move substances across the cell membrane. Uh, substances move down from their concentration gradient. This is a way to like increase this process faster. Here's a better kind of view of one of these uh, transport protein. Um, you have a hydrophobic tail that stops the lipids in these cells, are going to repel any of these hydrophilic cells. Therefore, ions and small polar molecules are able to pass through this protein channel in order so they can move across the membrane down their concentration gradient. That's why it doesn't require energy to function, it just requires energy to make them. And then we get to active transport. This is where you're going to be actively using ATP molecules to help move things across from one side of the cell to the other. Now, active transport occurs when membrane proteins use cellular energy to transport substances from the cell membrane. Uh, this type of membrane transport protein is often referred to as a pump. So you might hear a sodium ion pump that's usually some sort of active transport protein that exists in, the in, er, in between the membrane that's going to use ATP to take in sodium ions or push them out depending on which direction they need to go. Ultimately, these substances are usually moved up their concentration gradient. So this is, especially with these active ones, you're taking something that is, you're artificially increasing it on the inside of the cell or artificially decreasing it. So in other words, if say, for instance, you have a really salty environment, you may have more salt, um, salt uh, pumps to help push and keep those salt ions from going into the, um, into the cell membrane and keep those out as much as possible. So that way you don't go or become <sighs> hypotonic. Sorry, y'all, it's been a long day. Um, for instance, the classic example of this is the sodium potassium pump, which moves ions against their concentration gradients. So here outside of the cell, you have more sodium, whereas inside of the cell, we're going to maintain that higher level of potassium. So basically what this allows us to do is ATP, we can push out that sodium, those sodium ions back up to the outside of the cell and only bring in the potassium ions based off how they fit into that membrane protein. All right. So don't everybody jump up here at once. Um, we have a little bit of extra time as usual for Friday lectures. So um, do remember if you have any questions or anything, just come meet me up front and we can chat. But in the meantime, remember,
Thank <laughs> you. 